Okay, so welcome everybody um, to my talk today on the fourth hindrance. So first of all, if you'd just like to close your eyes. Just center yourself and take a big deep breath. Okay, very good. So, the fourth hindrance. What are the hindrances, you may be asking, some of you? Hindrances are things which obstruct our mental development. Um, and in our practice, Hindrances, what that means is something that stops us from being able to access states of deep calm. And then you may be asking, why the fourth one? What happened to one, two, and three, Noel? Um, well, I think one, two, and three, to me, are fairly self-explanatory. Um, the problems that I have had for many years stem from four, which why haven't you given it a name yet? We're gonna to come to that. Um, and also I've encountered this whenever I go to classes and I listen to people and I come up, you know, when I give myself excuses for not practicing, you know, it's the fourth hindrance that comes up. So I, I felt it was a good time to give a talk on the fourth hindrance. So I am going, I've got a few slides, so we're going to do a bit of a slideshow. Um, more for me than for anybody else, um, just to remind me about what I'm supposed to be talking about. Okay, the fourth hindrance. So what is it? You probably have some ideas in your head, something you've learned many years ago. Um, and that's what I'm going to explore first, because that's the Pali word for it, Uda Chakukicha, which I thought was an amazing name. It sounded like a Latin American dance, right? Not, not, not a bad thing at all, Uka Chakukicha, I think I could have a bit of that there. Um, but, you know, in the words of Trump, it's very, very bad. So it's two things, but they're together. So what do they mean? So udacha um, is commonly translated as restlessness, agitation, distraction, flurry, excitement. And in English, of course, we have quite a few words for the same thing with subtle different meanings. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think Pali is very useful. So sometimes if you experience something in practice, rather than label it with the word you already know in your native language, you give it the Pali words, you know what that flavor is, you know, and you know what it is when you're experiencing it. So if any of those words kind of click for you, then that's Udicha. And it is different from Kukicha which is worry, well, commonly translated as worry, um, guilt, remorse, regret. Please. And those feel very different from restlessness, agitation, distraction, excitement, etc. But um, the reason why they're lumped together, I feel, for the fourth hindrance is because they have the same effect on the mind. And that is this. So Buddha Gosa comments, and I don't have it open in front of me, so I'm not going to quote literally, but he says that 
Udacha Kukacha has the characteristics of water, a bowl of water specifically, whipped up by the wind. It's therefore it's like unstillness, and it has the characteristic of unsteadiness, like flags whipped up by the wind, and it's manifested as as turbulence, like um, a pile of ashes hit by a stone, and that kind of idea of a of billowing and flurrying and constant movement. And you can, you can, if you look at these for long enough, as I did when I was making this talk, you actually become restless. Um, and this is also mentioned by Buddhaghosa in the bowl with the water that's whipped up by the wind. The wind kind of carries the water over the sides of the bowl. So if you like, your restlessness is infectious and it's, it's carrying over to other people. Um, and the situation around you and vice versa anybody who's ever driven during rush hour after having done a practice can quite quickly find their tranquility utterly destroyed by um, by contagious restlessness um, so This is a list of the examples of causes of Udicca. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. You will not be surprised to hear. There are any number of sources of Udicca in life. But particularly during practice, these are the things that I have experienced and also what I hear a lot of people saying, you know, when I cut, when I say, take a class and I say, Oh, you know, have you been practicing recently? And they go, yeah, you know, yeah, I did a couple of practices, but you know, X, Y, Z. And these are the usual kinds of reasons that come up. And from the top to the bottom, we're going from pretty obvious crude, course to quite subtle. So at the top we have stimulants, um, caffeine, too much caffeine, too much sugar, too much TV, too much, too many Zoom calls. Um, and this has a very exciting effect on our bodies. And then when we come to sit, you know, the mind doesn't still. And I read somewhere that normally with this hindrance, it's mental agitation goes to bodily agitation. I think in this case, it's like the other way around. There's maybe some earlier form of mental agitation that leads one to take these stimulants anyway. Um, so we're just caught in the round of some star doing our habits. But it's something to be aware of because um, it can obstruct the practice. Too many, too few duties. So the Buddha comments on in the in the Metta Sutta, I think, about having too many duties. I, I think it's in there. It's basically it's, it's an obstacle if you have too many duties, basically. Um, and if you think about modern life, even under lockdown, we have too many duties where, you know, we're, we're praised for our productivity. Um, and we cram our lives filled with things. Um, how many times have you sat down to a practice and, uh, and then, you know, you're like, Oh, I didn't put the, what? I didn't put the bins out. Um, oh, I have to put the dinner on. Um, oh, I've got to do that thing for tomorrow. So, you know, that's, those are all examples of where that's an obstacle to us being able to reach deep states of calm. Conversely, too few duties is also a problem, which I experienced last year when I was unemployed during lockdown. You know, you dream about being unemployed, like it's going to be this great thing. You know, you have so much time, you have lots of practice. But in, in reality, what happens is you're bored out of your mind and you start to... Um, invent 
uh, narratives in your head and uh, effectively create like lots of restlessness. Like, why don't I have a job? When am I going to get a job? Um, why am I not practicing? Why can I not settle? And all these kinds of ideas. So, you know, oscillating between too many and too few duties is a source of restlessness in our practice, which leads to tight scheduling and rigidity. How many people have said, um, you know, my, my, where's my cushion? I don't have the right cushion. Um, this isn't where I, the time I normally do my practice. Um, you know, and that creates a lot of agitation. It's particularly, and on this I'm very, I'm very prone to this myself, is like tight scheduling. So I try and fit in a practice in the morning before I go to work. Um, work, go to work. Um, and the problem is that it's just already sort of stewing up in my head. And, you know, I want to sit for half an hour, but I start a bit too close to getting, having to get ready to go to work. And that creates an awful lot of mental agitation. And it's the same thing I see it time and time again with people who come to the class. It's like they've got the dinner on or, um, you know, they've got to put the kids to bed or um, some other tight scheduling idea, which really eats into their ability to, to focus. And most of the time that means people don't practice. So we'll come to that in a minute. Um, harsh speech. So this is new social media. So this, and this is not so much someone doing harsh speech, uh, which is obviously bad, but it's more the exposure to it. Um, you know, we're inundated with news and particularly social media. And you'll find that if you're, you're kind of looking at that kind of stuff before you sit, it, it does kind of stir up the mind, the kind of the sludge at the bottom of the pond, muddies the water. You can't really see the, the stillness of the mind. And then as we get slightly more subtle, excessive striving and doing, this is called out, so this can be in the practice where we really want to try and, and develop our practice. So we're, we're trying really hard to do something like concentrate on a particular stage, focus really hard with laser-like concentration on something um, or, or, or push ourselves on practicing too much. You know, it can happen, particularly in a practice week. So, that's not so much an unskillful thing to, to do as untimely or, you know, it's not right effort. So in that respect, it's not, not generating that kind of calm that we need in the practice in order to proceed. So it's counterproductive. Um, and that can happen a lot in beginners classes too. So it's one of the reasons why I've kind of brought that up. And then the last two, are particularly annoying um, things. So nimittas, I've put in nimittas, and the less talked about nimittas, the better in my mind, because what do I mean by nimittas? These are phenomena that arise during the practice, usually sensory phenomena, be it visual, auditory, or <coughs> touch, tangible experienced by different people in different ways um, and they're they are usually outside of our normal experience like there's something about them that is quite unusual that and what that does is immediately the mind goes um, what well, what was that you know it immediately arises excitement um, and almost immediately afterwards a chain of thought which requires quite a lot of stillness, uh, um, equanimity and skill really to, to deal with, um, to just be able to sit with phenomena as they arise and fall away. And then lastly, Samwega, what's that? So this is the 
the righteous urgency. Uh, it's translated in lots of different ways. So basically when the Buddha says, you know, practice diligently as if your hair was on fire, you know, you're going to get sick. You know, you're, you're healthy right now, but you're going to get sick. Um, you're perhaps younger and healthy now, but you're going to get old, potentially infirm, uh, and you're going to die. So, you know, practice while you have the chance. And that, I've, you know, just me even saying that, I'm sure that arises some degree of restlessness in, in you. Um, certainly does in me. And that's one of the reasons why Udicca is not just the fourth hindrance or part of the fourth hindrance, but it's actually like one of the higher fetters. So these are the, in fact, it's, it's one of the things that you lose upon gaining liberation or ceasing. Um, it's there right until the end, uh, that, that restlessness. So it's something I suppose we should get used to these subtle forms of, uh, of restlessness. So I appreciate it. This is a bit of a slide deck and it's probably arising a great deal of restlessness in you, but we're going to be getting to doing a, a practice shortly. So what are these antidotes to Udata? Um, I think this is quite simple advice, but no matter what stage you are in your practice, I think this will reap dividends. We have to guard the sense doors before we enter into a, a practice, just a little bit beforehand, before we start the, the mindfulness practice, to, to clear that out, to let it dissipate, to become aware of what's in the body, what's going on around us um, and kind of just let that settle. And that goes for adequate preparation as well, making sure you've, you're comfortable. Um, maybe you've set the scene, you know, candle, shrine. Um, you've set aside some time. You know how much time you have. You're going to make a mental statement of what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. And although it sounds very simple, these things will help a lot in terms of establishing calm and commitment to the practice that you're setting forward to do. And then during the practice, using mindfulness, of always mindfulness, so mindfulness should always be present, we should try to stop striving and stop doing things. So if you notice that restlessness is a problem during your preparation or um, it arises, the, in one of the suttas, the Buddha states that it is untimely to cultivate three of the enlightenment factors. So this Dhamma Vichaya, which is investigation, Virya, effort, and Piti, which is joy or joyful energization. I find this quite surprising because obviously if I get any of these working well in my practice, I'm pretty happy, you know, happy as Larry. But what he's saying is, is it's not that they're bad, it's just untimely. Um, uh, this is from a sutta. And the reason is he uses the analogy of a blaze or a fire. And he says, if you have a fire, do you throw dry grass, dry cow dung, um, dry things on it, basically dry wood, um, to, to extinguish the fire? And the bhikkhus say, no. You don't do that. And he says, well, that's correct because why? So you don't cultivate these things whenever your mind is restless because they, it doesn't settle the mind. So 
investigation. This is this is going seeking after the observing the marks and things like that so of existence, um, dukkha and permanence, and so a lot of mental stuff potentially coming in. Um, Wiria. So this is like the real striving, like the effort. Like I'm going to sit for an hour and I'm going to do. You know, it's probably not the best thing to do if you're feeling restless. And then PT, trying to arouse a lot of energy in your body when your mind is 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 unstable and is untimely. So what is timely? Lepida says, you know, for the fire, you should put wet grass and wet cow dung and wet wood and scatter dirt all over it, and that will extinguish the the blaze because the, these three enlightenment factors settle the mind, pasadi, samadhi, and upeka. So pasadi is tranquility, tranquilization, samadhi, concentration, and upeka, equanimity. You might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but that's what we're trying to do. Yes, that is right. If you go and look at a lot of these Dharma talks, they're primarily done by Vipassana, very accomplished Vipassana teachers, monks, etc. And they always say, oh, you know, restlessness, you know, the, the antidote to restlessness is breath meditation. And I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm doing breath meditation. Like that, the problem is, this is like chicken and egg here. I'm like, I'm not able to settle the mind. Well, I think what they mean is, that because they're focusing a lot on Dhamma Vichaya, so investigating, arising and falling away, you know, it's it's important to kind of settle back and try and unify the mind, samadhi, and tranquilize the body. Um, so we're going to do a little experiment now. We're going to do a little practice. You'd be happy to hear. Um, I've been experimenting with this because I uh, trick myself uh, a lot. So in the morning, I've been trying to do a practice before work. And inevitably, um, this, uh, was it the eighth precept? It's one of the precepts about be having a high bed. I now understand why that is an obstacle to practice. Um, trying to get out of bed when you work from home and do a practice is like, uh, I don't know, it's just like one of the hardest things in the universe now. Um, And so I'm constantly playing this battle with myself to do a practice. And then inevitably I don't have enough time, or if I do have enough time, I'm backing up onto the schedule and I can't settle the mind. So we're going to do an experiment now. We're going to do a a tranquilization practice, I've made it up. So it's not in any sutta, don't burn me as a heretic, but uh, we're gonna give it a go and you can see if it works for you because it's only gonna last about five or 10 minutes, probably five to be honest, but you can maybe integrate this as part of your preparation for a practice or do it when your mind tells you, oh, I can't do a full practice because I have to rush off somewhere or I have to put the dinner on. Okay, so we're not gonna look at my face. We're gonna look at this beautiful tranquil pond. Um, What I would like you to do is Settle your mind. Bring your attention to the body and the breath. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pick a length of breath that feels right for you right now. Could be the longest, could be the longer, could be the shorter or even the shortest but you wanna pick a length of breath that you feel will tranquilize you. And what we 
we're going to do is we're going to practice for a few minutes doing the following. So pick a length of breath that feels right for you now. The longest of following, the longer of following, the shorter of following, or the shortest of following. And observe the quality of the breath. Is it stunted? Is it, is it jarring? Is it uneven? Now let that observation go. Let the breath be even, just let go. Let it be light. Let it be soft. Let it be smooth and even. During this, become aware of any tension in the body. Clenched muscles. Subtle around the nose, the eyes, the scalp, the face. Just breathe into that space and let it go. Notice any twitching, tension energy blocks, let that go. And if your mind or if the breath slips to a different length, let it happen, but be mindfully aware of it. If your breath slips from the following to the settling, the touching, let it happen. But be mindfully aware of it. Just notice any gladness in the mind that arises. And just rejoice in that gladness. Gently return to the length of breath that you were using for the following. And 
Recollect what you feel like now versus the practice, before the practice. See if you can instinctively know, did you see any signs of restlessness within your body, within your mind? Do you instinctively know why they're there? This is not something you want to think about. Just catch, you can see if you can get that feeling, that deep knowledge, where that's coming from. And as soon as you start to think about it, let it go. And finish the practice. Okay, so take a deep breath, everyone, because we're going to move on to Kukuchi now. This one's harder. So, Kukuchi. Same result, different cause. This is re regret, remorse, guilt for things we have done. Regret, remorse, guilt for things we have not done. The analogy here is that someone stuck up to their waist in mud, courtesy of the Daily Express at the top right-hand corner. So just try to bring to mind what that would feel like. It's heavy, it's sticky, it's stuck. It's pulling down on that, that sinking feeling is a common phrase used in English. And that's kind of what this regret and remorse and guilt feels like, like a weight pulling down on your heart or your stomach. And of course this is Obviously, a hindrance to a practice where we're trying to generate calm, lightness, softness, gentleness. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why I have not used worry. For me, worry, we, when you say fourth hindrance, people go restlessness and worry. You know, it's usually rattled off. And for me, that never resonated with me. Worry is bad, okay? But worry is one of those words in English that has many different meanings. And I think what we're talking about here with Kukuchi is that it's something that happened in the past. It's something that has been done or has not been done, okay? And okay, the effect is the same, but why I'm telling you this is because the diagnosis you need to understand what it is so you can try and fix it. And it's not the same as moral shame, no, which is called hiri, or moral fear, otapa, which relate to the future, and these are the guardians as it were, that are talked about in, in the suttas that stop someone from doing something. If you like, it's your conscience, okay? 
it, but it's like a learned behavior. Like I've done this before, you know, you know, you, you think to yourself, I could have a, another biscuit. I could have, I could have another bottle of wine, but um, I know where that's going to lead. And it's led there before. And I don't really want to do that anymore. So is that worry? Mm. I think it's moral shame and moral fear, right? So worry, the worry comes up a lot in, in what I've read from the Winaya and from, from talking about bhikkhus, people who are monastics, and the, the worry stemming from in case they break a precept, in case they break one of the rules, because there's like so many, and that agitates their practice. And we don't really live in that world. Well, most of us don't. So I think for this, it's really regret, remorse, and guilt that we need to be dealing with. And it doesn't necessarily relate to unskillful actions. And this can be a bit of a trap. I'll give you an example. Now forgive me if this hurts some people because it's, but for example, you know, when we've lost a loved one and we think to ourselves, you know, if only I'd said something or um, I never had a chance to do X, Y, and Z or, and you blame yourself for something that you have no control over. Um, it wasn't necessarily an unskillful action, but it's it, it's still something that the mind gravitates to. Um, even worse, if someone has done something as a result of our deeds, you know, and and we can't take that back. Um, so those are things that the mind gravitates to that are not necessarily unskillful that may not have been a, an unskillful action or or that that resulted in this so what do we do about that the problem is is when it lingers this sticky quality regret remorse and guilt for things we have done which have been unskillful is a good thing so it stops us from doing it again, it leads to Hiri and Otapa. The problem is, is when it lingers and it leads to a, a condition of mental slavery where we're stuck in the mud and we can't do anything. And there's a lot of writing around this that I didn't fully understand and I didn't really include it, but it's around, um, it got a bit philosophical about God and stuff, gurus. When we're in a condition of mental slavery, we tend to outsource forgiveness to some other entity, a group of people, a guru, a god, because we feel powerless to help ourselves. And I think that's one of the keys to why it lingers around. You know, the Buddha says you have to do it for yourself. Um, you can't outsource this to someone else or something else. Um, so that stems from a wrong view or an unskillful view of the way that the world works. And weirdly, I think it also lingers from an attachment to self as weird as this sounds, we're attached to our guilt, our regret, our remorse. It defines who we are. Um, it, 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 it's an example of how much we loved a particular person if it's manifesting as grief. It's, it's, a, it's attachment to self that somehow I am a bad person or I'm a good person. Um, 
um, you know, that's that's very deep, and I think you just have to become aware of that. Why does it linger? And then the classic one, ill will, ill, Ill will towards oneself. Why does it linger? Because we enjoy punishing ourselves, you know. Why did why did I do that? Um, I think this actually gets worse as we develop in the practice because the stakes are higher. It's kind of like, you know, I thought I was over that. Um, I really shouldn't have said that. Why? Why did I do that? You know, and you just have to be very careful about that. See it for what it is. It's ill will, which leads us very neatly on to the antidotes, Hukicha. I didn't come up with these symbols. The weird chatbot that rules Microsoft PowerPoint actually found these for me. So I thought I'd use them. The, uh, the antidotes to Kukacha are, in my opinion, from what I've read, forgiveness, compassion, mindful investigation, and patience. Probably in that order. Easier said than done, I think. So, for those of you who maybe attended my, one of the talks that I've given previously, um, uh, there was a little practice, and we're going to do that again in a minute, on forgiveness and compassion. So we'll hold off on those. So this is generating compassion for oneself, balanced with compassion for others, because I think it should always be balanced. And then mindful investigation. This is an interesting one. This is about finding what the root cause of the guilt feeling is, or the grief feeling is, and it may not be what it appears. And that takes an awful lot of honesty. So why people can manifest grief because they think that they miss the person, that they love them. But actually there can be quite a lot more than that going on. There can be attachment there, but there can also be, you know, an acknowledgement that that person hurt you um, and they never got their comeuppance. Oh, or um, for regret, it can be something that you may have done as a child when you didn't really know um, what you were doing. And there's no way of like going back and fixing some of those things. I know that's pretty heavy stuff, but everyone has their own story there. And it's, it's about really investigating what it is that's causing this. And then patience with mindfulness. And a really good one here was from Ajahn Achalo, um, who I follow. I, 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 it's, it's bizarre. Whenever I was looking for stuff about um, remorse and guilt and all that, I couldn't find anything that really clicked. And then I was watching something about something else. And he started talking about the mind playing tricks on you. So you may have already done the compassion, you may have already done the forgiveness and the mindful investigation, and the mind just keeps um, coming back to this thing, this feeling, you know, giving you a good kick um, when you're when you're just feeling settled. And so Ajahn Achalo was like saying, what he does 
is he counts the number of times that the mind returns to that thing. And he says, this is the 37th time that, you know, we've gone over this. I, we've done this, you know, I forgive myself. I feel compassion towards myself. And then he says, he, he chose a hundred. He says, after the hundredth time, he tells the mind, we're not going to think about this anymore. And it will go away. It will dissipate. I thought a hundred was a lot, but perhaps if we're conscious about things that obsess us, perhaps, you know, it does come up that often. So that's, we're going to do another practice now because I feel like I've spoken enough. And then we're going to have time for discussion. So we're going to do um, a forgiveness and compassion practice, which is extracted from the Vinaya. Um, this came from the practicing of Brahma Vihara's talk that I did. So apologies if that causes you restlessness, that we're going over old colds, but that's what practice is. Practice is returning to things which are beneficial and doing them over and over again. So what I would like you to do is assume a nice posture. Center yourself. Establish mindfulness of the breath and bring your attention to the heart area. How does it feel today? Light, heavy, dark. So listen to some of these phrases, repeat them over to yourself in your mind, perhaps change the words to suit your particular scenario. If there is any way I have suffered harm by reason of anything I have thought or said or done, I forgive myself. If there is any way I have harmed another on purpose or by accident, by reason of anything I have thought or said or done, I ask forgiveness. If there is any way another has harmed me, knowingly or unknowingly, through action of body, speech or mind, I forgive them. May I live with ease and in safety, free from physical affliction. May I be open to any physical suffering in me with courage, with caring, with kindness.
May I live with ease, free of remorse, free of regret, free of guilt, free of grief. May I be open to any mental suffering in me with courage, with caring, with kindness. May I open to the suffering that I see in others. May we open to each other's suffering with courage, with caring, and with kindness. May all beings live with ease and be free from suffering. May I live with ease and be free from suffering. And I recollect how you felt. See if you can instinctively know or feel any causes of kukacha, any remorse, guilt, regret that may linger inside you. And when you start to think about it, let it go. And finish your practice. Okay. I love it because um, some of the messages are that people really liked the talk, but they had to rush somewhere. <laughs> uh, and that, I think, means it's a very good medicine for our time. Um, so that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, I'm going to open the floor for discussion over to you, Veronica. Thank you. Um, just wanted to say that I had to put your teaching into practice the whole way through because I didn't mute all at the beginning. <laughs> and therefore, um, unless I'm looking around now, I think most people have either muted themselves, but oh. I don't know what happened. But I had to keep saying, don't worry, uh, because... Um, I hadn't muted everyone, and it might have spoiled the peacefulness. So Not at all. Every time the thought came up, I would say, don't worry. <laughs> and it really did work. And, and not to worry, you know, um, sometimes. And, and, and that's, that's um, just what, it's as simple as that. And as soon as I allowed that, and I think it was all right, I don't know. I thought testimony to everyone's attention because they weren't unmuted. <laughs> and and there, weren't, there was one little sound effect that came up when the, the lilies were on just at the end. I think it was a siren and I thought, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, strange mm -hmm. that that came just then. Um, so even better that it didn't. <laughs> so, yes, so, yeah. the universe keeps on giving.
<laughs> when it comes to disturbance, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and while I've got the, the floor, so to speak, I was in a bit of a panic to begin with. I was so surprised by this message and had no idea how to deal with it. Um, and I did allow myself to get very restless, uh, right, a full dose of that, that um, hindrance. And I think I indulged it a bit because on another occasion, I might have just, just been calmer. Um, and so when the instruction for the breath came, it was like magic. Um, it, it really does work, um, but there has to be a conscious intention to, to, to make it work. And it was so fortunate to have you guide us or you or it might be any teacher or someone and you, you can, um, they can do, it can do it in such a, a wonderful way, change, you know, that hindrance or negative state. But we have to learn to do it for ourselves as well, you know, and, and in order like to get out of the bed, there has to be that conscious intention and, um, and trust and faith in, in, in the capacity to do it. Because it's very easy to... Um, uh, somehow wait to be rescued, you know. But um, I'm really grateful for that. And as I said, I was constantly putting it into practice uh, <laughs> throughout. Um, and um, I don't know now uh, whether people are muted. It looks like you've all got mute signs up. Did you do that yourself or did you do it, Noel? I didn't, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Magic. So let's have a look round. Liz has got a blue hand. Liz Walford. Um, so you go first, Liz. Thank you. What a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I find these this kind of practical talk so helpful. So helpful. Uh, when it when it veers on to what I call high theory, I can't. I find it very difficult and, and uh, resistance arises. But one thing I noticed was <clears throat> with, um, when we did the, when we did the first meditation with the, what do you call it? Udacha? Udacha. Udacha. Mm. Udacha. I, I wondered when does I often have this problem of, am I tranquilized or am I actually in sloth and torpor? Mm -hmm. where, where does, where the, where's the tipping point? Or is, is it just a matter of noticing and pulling back or, or, or relaxing or whatever? Perhaps yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I was worried about being burnt as a heretic the important thing is to have mindfulness there at all times. Um, if you have really sharp, mindful awareness of what's happening, you, you'll kind of be able to notice that little slip because everything moves in cycles. So yes, if you really pent up energy and you kind of let that go, that can lead to sleepiness and um, real dullness of the mind. But if you can maintain the mindfulness, even noticing that is is still progress but as it goes back to kind of keeping the breath light soft even um a bright sense a sense of brightness in in the mind and in the in the body and and that that practice is kind of a physical practice a little bit I find that what happens is I find that I'm tensing like little muscles in my head or in my chest that are restricting the breath. And when I let that, that go, you know, there's this gladness arises, this real sense of tranquility and, and peace and calm. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I kind of decided to stick with the following because it's a bit coarser than, than say, the settling. Because then, you know, you might really slip off into never, never land or something. Whereas with the following, you maybe you have something to grab, to cling to. And that connection with the body still about seeing where, 
you know, the diaphragm or, or the neck, you can kind of see all those energies moving around and it's a bit harder to, to fall asleep, I think. Thank you. I can see that Francis has got a blue hand there. Are you there, Francis? I am. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Very good. No, very good. Um, I've, um, <clears throat> so there's, for me, there's something interesting with these two in particular in relation to the mind and the body. And the antidote for them is um, non-distraction. So that when the mind is not distracted, then there's something that's very usefully um, starting to overcome them. Um, but sometimes what that means is that you feel it more in the body, to me. Um, so that if it's almost like you kind of, if there's something in the past that you've done that you feel is wrong, if you almost feel the shame in your, in your heart and in your body without going to the words, um, that can then have a powerful effect in, um, in resolving it. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with the, with the kind of worry, agitation towards something in the future, something you, that's going to happen or that you're kind of thinking about. If you can, if you can kind of return to the body and just feel something to do with that in the body and to and to and tranquilize that and not be distracted by the thoughts about it and um, again that often seems a very um, powerful way to do something about it and i think that's it's also as interested you brought up um brought up sang vega because i think that in a way, makes that point that the that the Sang Vega is the um, is our kind of physical reaction to um, to to impermanence and to dukkha. Um, so it's a kind of it, it's it, it's a kind of a stirring within us. And that's not, that is good. That's not something that we need to worry about. And it's not the same um, as the agitation. It, it's a kind of powerful stirring within us to actually do something in connection with these, with these sorts of things. Um, um, and so it's, if it's, if you, if you, if you can, you can come to a point where you feel them in the body without it going to distracted thoughts. Then for me, that's a, a kind of long way along the road. And then something may calm further, something may, may kind of tranquilize further. Yeah, thanks for raising the, the worry. It's not that worry isn't something we need to worry about. Um, I think for me, it resonates that it's more udacha, so more like that mental agitation and excitement aspect. Because udacha for me feels like something that's happening right now or, or could happen in the future. Whereas the kukacha part is kind of looking back. Um, and it's a semantics thing, really, but it's kind of how do you then deal with it? Um, and the sam, samvega thing. I suppose I included it for completeness. Just if you're lucky enough to be like a non-returner, um, it's kind of you have to give up on on the rest. It's it's a it's an obstacle to liberation apparently. To that's that subtle striving. So um, 
that, that kind of restlessness manifests in very subtle ways at the end. I think we've personally have bigger problems to deal with. Um, I'll worry about that later. I think. <laughs> yes, I think the only other thing I'd say is that worry often has an underlying purpose. So in a sense, there's, there's a bit of it that sometimes is trying to get us to do something. Um, and if we do it, then the worry goes. Mm. Sometimes we can't do anything about it, and that's and that, as you say, when, is a kind of different situation. And it's the obsession with, and it is an obsession. It's an obsessive disorder to constantly return. If you know you have to do something, like prepare a talk for next Saturday, is a good example. Then, you know it constantly plays on your mind, even though you're thinking, why am I getting upset about this? It's just a talk. But the brain's trying to make you kind of do stuff, as you say, and, it, and, and being able to set that aside for a moment is very skillful. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, during our practice, when we're letting the noise of our lives decrease, the little things kind of start to poke up through the through the grass and re-manifest themselves again. Um, so it is a hindrance, but working with the hindrances is what this is, is all about. Uh, That's right. Thank you. I noticed that there was Deborah and then Matthew and then Cos. They came up in that order. So, Deborah, mm. hi. Thank you, Neil, for an, a wonderful talk. So experiential. Um, a bit like Veronica, I'd had something quite a small thing, just a, a silly thing that had annoyed me before the talk. Um, so I had that to work with at the beginning. And um, recently I've got quite into trying to do very short practices in everyday situations so literally just two or three minutes you know in a busy situation if I feel like I'm not as settled as I could be and it seems so wonderful to bring the practice into those everyday situations and and actually use the fact that it is challenging so that as as lay people with complex lives we have quite challenging things go on but they're actually sort of wonderful opportunities to to put some of this into practice Something I was thinking is that I think quite often underneath worry, there is um, fear. And I think um, some of it might be, a, it, you know, there's kind of so many layers quite often. Um, I mean, I have heard it said that the ultimate fear is fear of extinction or fear of dying, um, but or fear of somehow being obliterated or not being able to cope. And I think it's quite interesting when there's anxiety or worry as in worrying about what could happen, which can be quite big things, quite big, scary things, to really explore that, because I think it's a real opportunity to change one's view. Um, I think, like Francis said, it is telling us something, um, and it might be that by exploring it and going down through the layers, because it's like it can give you a sense of urgency, because the worry is quite unpleasant. And if you can stop being caught in all the surface waves, but start looking at what's going on deeper underneath then it's kind of an opportunity to perhaps change one's view. Um, um, thank you. Thanks for that, yeah. And then I can see Matthew, Matthew, his hand up, and then Cos, and then Peter Harvey. Okay, I just want to say thank you for that, Noel. Um, from what you're talking about, it sounds like you're talking about redirecting energy. So when you've got like a negative energy, in the body or in the mind, wherever it is. It sounds like you're talking about moving that energy into a positive thing. Because I've experienced this sort of thing before where you get a letter, you know, maybe a, an overdue bill maybe, and you get all this kind of thing in the body, and it's all, ah, oh, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? And it's all kind of like, not like bubbles, all like, all like bubbling up. But then you kind of like, slowly but surely bring it down, bring it down, and calm it all down and go, right, so what are we going to do? So. Logically, you know, you've got to kind of say, you know, delay that for another month or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And it can mm-hmm. kind of change from a kind of panic, worry sort of a state into a more confident state. It can actually become a fuel to to kind of boost, to kind of push, really. I'm kind of a bit mm-hmm. confused with the hindrances sometimes. I think 
But aren't these hindrances actually helpful? Because they're actually there to, as I say, as a fuel to kind of boost you, boost you along in a sense. Because hmm. yeah. what's happening when it's that spinning around the wheel of conditioned arising. So, you know, when we contact things like bills, right? It, the mind moment, it's so fast. We're spinning around that wheel so fast. The mind's on fire, you know, contact feeling, um, you know, and then craving or aversion, some push it away, push it away. And the whole spinning, that's all going on. Sometimes subconsciously, like we're not even aware. Um, so that energy arises and energy, yeah, I know positive energy and, and negative energy do get bandied around. I, I'm not sure if there's inherent, there's energy. And of course, what we, what we can do with that energy is what matters. I think the energy doesn't know if it's positive or negative, but certainly if we associate it with those feelings, then negative things can result. Stress can result. Dukkha, you know, that feedback loop. But, or we can use that, like you say, like a bit of a kick, a trigger. Like, what's happening, you know? And I try and interrupt that, um, that cycle and with mindfulness and just investigate it. I mean, you've got loads going on there you, you know the the enlightenment factors and it's just so much that if you once you intercept that in time you know it's it's you can turn it around um to something profitable for yourself and also to stop the water spilling over the bowl and agitating everyone else in your immediate contacts you know Texting people, posting it on social media, and generating flurry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I just want to say quickly again at the end for the for that, for that practice with it, that forgiveness practice. It was quite. It was it was good to visualize like the energy moving and changing from sort mm. of positive into negative, and it was like. Kind of getting the new suits of armor in a sense, kind of like, right, I'm I'm ready for this now, you know? Kind of like like psyching yourself up for something, you know. And I think renaming the energy or re is is something incredibly skillful if we can do that in our lives. Um because we're gonna need energy. Like if you if you constantly battle negative thoughts, negative energy. It's a zero sum game because it, you're sapping all your strength. But if you can change that energy, view it differently, then um, as you say, it's, it's protection. Thank you. So, Cos, are you ready there with your point, Cos? I'm ready, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. And uh, the theme of worry, which you flagged up at the beginning, was really useful because, as you said, uh, we, we, we say worry flurry. It's a nice pair of rhyming words. And uh, it's made me uh, reflect on that use. I, um, uh, on, on the theme of sort of uh, it's being flagged up about making teachings. Uh, relevant to the everyday lives of us lay people. Um, uh, there's, did, did, did the Buddha have anything about procrastination? <laughs> uh, I, I know towards the end of his ministry, he, he said, uh, I have, what I've taught you is but this handful of leaves. And um, had he lived longer or the, a certain person had come up, with the question of um, procrastination, mm. which uh, uh, is a feature of many lives in, in, in you know, the busy everyday lives uh, that we live out, out of a monastic setting. Yeah. Um, 
there are many people out there probably more qualified to talk about this, but the one that comes to my mind actually came up as a result of these talks. Um, I think Sarah Shaw talked about the Diga Nagaya, and then um, Peter put the Sigala Sigaloka Wada Sutta, I think it's called, which is an instruction to lay people. And there's a new translation of it. I thought it was it was funny, actually. So there's a bit in it where um, the, the Buddha says about talks about laziness, and he talks about like the six unskillful ways that people deal with laziness. It's like, oh, he thinks I'm too full and does not work. I am hungry and does not work. I am sleepy and does not work. I am too excited and does not work. I am, uh, I can't remember the other two now. Um, but basically it's kind of like, you know, it's the, all the reasons we give to ourselves why not to do something. It was quite funny. And the way it was expressed is just, if you start to see it for as it is, that you're just making excuses for yourself and try and laugh at your own mind. Um, it, you can start to see will, will future cause thank me for doing this task or, or not, you know? And you start to see the profit in the activity and then you can almost trick yourself into doing stuff. Like I find myself doing that an awful lot with um, bargaining, like an insane schizophrenic. I can't do a 30 minute practice. Oh, you know, but you know, you do have 20 minutes. All right, I'll do 10. All right, you're going to do 10? Well, do 10, then do 15. And then afterwards you can have a cup of tea. Oh, all right, then I'd like a cup of tea. Right? Insane stuff. But actually, um, you know, if you start to, and you laugh at that, but then you do it and you feel fine. Yeah. The important thing is not to let that guilt and regret and remorse thing creep in. Like, cause you might be addicted to feeling bad about yourself for not having done a task. It, it, there's a little bit of humor came up in the, uh, I'm just looking at a note I made about the uh, Ajahn, Achalo, mm -hmm. yeah, him counting the number of times he returned something, uh, and then like when he came to thirty-seven or a hundred. All right, that's enough. I've had enough, <laughs> uh, and then deal with it. Yeah, and I think it, there's an element of resolve or uh, mm -hmm. commitment. It's almost like getting the mind ready to let it go too. You know, you're on number 67, but you're only going to bring this up 33 more times. I'm not going to give it any more attention. I've already, if you've done the work, I've already forgiven myself. I've already shown myself compassion. You know, I've done what I can. This is still coming up. Um, and just to kind of have that patience um, might help. I, I, I haven't got to 100 yet because i only really found out about it this week you know if the things come up i'm starting to to say mm, and put it into practice to see if it works <clears throat> thank you thank you Noel. i think peter um was there. yeah i think a sense of humor is important taking yourself too seriously can embed some of these and i was i always think of tommy cooper's doctor he said, I kept going to my doctor. I said, if I do this, it, it hurts me. So he says, well, don't do it. <laughs> it's just straight there. <laughs> I remember Paul Dennison said he once met Tommy Cooper. And he said, I think he may have been a stream enterer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, a sense of humor about yourself. Because the, the kutkutcha, I mean, a word that you didn't mention is unease. Mm. Which is neither to do with the future or the past. It's kind of, I'm maybe I'm no good or I'm no good at this meditation or whatever. And it's a kind of low. The two parts of hindrance, the uducha, is kind of <sighs> over energized. Mm. And the kuchacha is, mm, uh, it may be perhaps a res as a result of 
um, you've been criticized for something rightly or wrongly, and you're feeling a little bit low and sagging. And I actually remember Lance many years ago, he says, um, this fourth hindrance in strong form is manic depression. It's kind of, I mean, obviously, mm. most of us don't suffer that, but it's either up here too much, down there too much, not finding a nice, easeful middle, which relates to the perhaps sukha, happiness, easeful pleasure being the jhana factor which counteracts this form mm. of interest. Finding the kind of happy, balanced middle ground and not taking yourself too seriously so you're carrying around your issues and going, I'm no good, blah, 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 blah. But mm. coming back to the body and how the body feels, that's can help you put that down yeah yeah agree yeah i didn't mention the traditional antidotes um because i think it felt too formulaic it was like to me it was the result like the sukha part like oh yeah i'm just supposed to be happy now you know that kind of uh that it's kind of like, well, that's where I'm trying to get to. How do I get there? And it, and that's yeah. that kind of the baby steps idea of, okay, like the, the that practice when you see the gladness arising in the mind from the tranquilization, just note that because that's that's what we're talking about. That's yeah. the that's yeah. the sukha. That's the and then eventually with that with that recollection. You can bring that into your practice and be able to access that sukkah more quickly next time. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 I see that Rajiv has put his hand up now. Rajiv, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you and see you uh, as well. The, what's the one that the arahat gets rid of? Is it kukucha or the udacha? Because uh, one of the one of the ten hindrances is the um, of the ten higher hind- uh, the higher fetters is restlessness, isn't it? Yeah, udacha. I think it's number nine. When I was looking this up, no, number nine, restlessness. Five. It's one of the higher fetter things that non-returners. So, so it's the ud- so it's the udacha one. Yeah. Okay, udacha. All right, restlessness. So, so is that the high or the low? It's high. It's on high on the list. All right. Okay. Yeah, it's All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I can't see anyone, but I thought I would use my role as coast to just say that um, when, when we meet beginners, quite a few of us will have taken lots of beginners, you know, people first time. And it, it's such a hindrance. As so many say, um, uh, I can't do it, or my mind's too restless. I've got a problem mm-hmm. with my mind. My mind just won't settle. I've heard it so many times, and they felt it was an individual problem that they had, uh, that nobody else had, or they had it worse than anybody else. And and um, and, and that you described it so well that if if you can get to the other side it or, or find a way through, but that's often the excuse or the reason, and people unless they they realize or experience some freedom from that, uh, I don't know how to say that, the hindrance, kukacha, uh, they, they, they won't go further. And, and it, it is quite a beginning point as well, um, you know, that many teachers will have said over and over again, it's not just you, it's everyone. We have this, but um, not to worry about it. There is a way through it. And also, I wanted to say um, that that practice that we did, the, the, the second one um, of seeking to, that if there's any thought or word or deed or anything I've done which has offended you, forgive me, on two occasions it's been used at a funeral. A Buddhist friend um, wanted that said um, at, in her funeral. Um, And uh, it was very moving. There was nothing she could have done to offend us at all. And it happened twice. Uh, One was Penpon. Some of you might have known her. Um, And it really mattered to them so much. It was their request that at their funeral, those words were spoken, you know, if I've done anything to harm you, hurt you, forgive me. And similarly, 
you know, I forgive you. It was very, very, very moving that. And, and um, I just wondered, I don't know if it's a Buddhist practice, but, but maybe it is. But they were, I just wanted to say how, how, um, how powerful that can be um, in, a, in, a, in just in an ordinary way, but in a, you know, a more serious context. So um, how would you like to close the meeting now? I'll, I'll chant a blessing if everyone goes on mute to, to, so that there's no restlessness. And then, um, and then you can all sadhu and go about your day's business. Okay? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Bhava to Saba Mangalang Rakan to Saba Buddha Saba Buddha Venus and Sati Pamantiti Bhava to Saba Mangalang Rakan to Saba De Wata Saba Dhamma Nuba Vena Sada Sati Pamantiti Bhava to Saba Mangalang Rakan to Saba Devata Saba Sangha Nubhavena Sada Soti Bhavantu Te Adu Sadu 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 Sadu